views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guest, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. You are listening to the Psychic Professors Show, the Voices of Spirit Radio, with international medium and spirit artist Dr. Susan Barnes. This hit call-in show will answer any questions you have about spiritual communication through on-air readings and spirit artistry. Get ready to receive breakthrough wisdom to enliven and enlighten your life. To say this show is educational is an understatement. Dr. Susan is the medium through which spirit communication occurs and fills the canvas of your life. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Susan Barnes, and you are listening to The Psychic Professor Show on Transformation Talk Radio. Stay with us for the next hour and let us help you experience the voices of spirit. Each week on Psychic Professor Show, we will have some of the most knowledgeable spiritual voices helping you to answer your spiritual questions. And today, I have George Hansen here to discuss psychic and paranormal phenomena. At the end of the show, I will do some short readings for listeners. So remember, the phone number is 800-930-2819. So you can give us a call. Now, George is a very special person. He is the author of the book, The Trickster and the Paranormal. And he is one of the most knowledgeable people that I know on issues of the paranormal. So welcome, George. Well, thank you, Susan. Now, I have to ask you my basic question. How has spirit influenced your life? Well, I'm not sure if it has or not. It depends on how you define spirit. One of the things that's always bugged me a little bit about paranormal is this term spirit and spirituality. And it really is kind of vaguely defined, especially in this country. I think uh, some German philosophers have made more of a stab at it, and I'm starting to read uh, on it. But the whole idea of spirit is rather ambiguous in most people's minds, and I can't really address it effectively right now. I'm looking at some continental philosophy uh, that tends to uh, use that term more frequently than it is used in uh, this country. But uh, it just doesn't communicate too well with me. So if you'd like to rephrase that, please do. Well, um, what I'm thinking is that obviously something in your life has led you towards doing paranormal research. And that has probably some spiritual influences. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Well, yes. um, My father uh, was or claimed to be a dowser. And my finding water with, he used a crowbar. And my mother was pretty skeptical. She wasn't sure if my dad was uh, pulling her leg or not. But actually, he went out into our backyard and found a spot and started digging and digging, and he struck water. And the neighbors were quite skeptical and very surprised that he hit water. Uh, And he said he did it using this crowbar, then it would start to shake in his hand. And I started taking that kind of seriously. Some years later, uh, there was a free university course on dowsing or water witching, and I took that course, and it was presented as though it might be a psychic phenomenon. And from then on, I was hooked. And I start. I eventually wrote a paper on dowsing, and became involved with a parapsychology course out in California at the University of California at Irvine. And from there, I went on and to the Rhine Center in North Carolina and to Princeton, New Jersey, where there was psychophysical research laboratories. Yes, it, it's really involved my entire adult life. So, yes, uh, but it's it sounds like you it's that was a wonderful story that you got interested from from a childhood experience and from your own father believing in it. But let us first get some definitions um 
straight here. What is paranormal phenomena? Well, paranormal phenomena are phenomena that do not have a scientific explanation yet. Uh, things like levitation of tables in spiritual uh, seances or ESP or mind over matter, those are examples. Uh, it's probable that uh, much of the UFO phenomena are um, paranormal in some sense. So it's a phenomena like that that are kind of escape uh, our scientific understanding. So so I'm going to give you um, one more example. So I know several people that have had voices of their loved ones come through the telephone after they've been deceased. And I'm assuming that would fall under the category of paranormal, too. Y yes, indeed. Uh, that's a little harder to uh, study scientifically because they're spontaneous. But yes, what were called phone calls from the dead have been reported for quite a long time. And yes. yes that would be uh, a paranormal phenomena. It might possibly have, some of them might have possibly some normal explanations, but some perhaps not. So yes, I'm very open to uh, looking at those kinds of phenomena. Oh, great. Now, is there a difference between psychic and paranormal? Well, <sighs> psychic typically refers to an individual's mind, an individual paranormal a paranormal person might have phenomena around them, might have synchronistic experiences. A psychic generally would be a person who gets impressions or have precognitive uh, events um, or, or something like that. So there is para, all psychics would be involved with the paranormal, but not okay. all paranormal phenomena would necessarily involve psychics. Okay, I understand that. That's like all medium are psychics, but not all psychics are mediums. Right, um, exactly. Yeah, and I would say, but I would say that so the paranormal part of it, like, would come in on a seance when the table's levitating, or um, there's lights or sounds or different things happening. Yes. And the yes. psychic part of it would be if you go to a medium to get a reading. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay, so we're clear on that. Now, how, when did this start? Let's look at this a little bit historically. When did they start studying the paranormal? Well, there have been people studying the paranormal for a very long time. It goes back hundreds of years. But the first real ongoing investigation, the group that's still going today, started in 1882. And that was the Society for Psychical Research, and it was founded in London way back over 130 years ago, 135 years ago now. And they're still in existence. They publish a journal, and they also have a more popularly written magazine. And many of the back issues of the journals can be found in uh, certain academic libraries around the world. And some of the most eminent people of their day were involved. There were a number of Nobel laureates who were members of this society. So that's, that's basically when the established ongoing scientific investigation began. Now, course, so, were, so, yeah, so there, are, there, so there are people ongoing with research that write papers for it today. Yes. In fact, uh, right now, as we speak, over in Athens, there is the annual convention of the Parapsychological Association, and it's underway. Uh, it's, I think, a three- or four-day event. I was just looking at the abstracts of that uh, convention. And it's a, small, it's a relatively small group. It's uh, the, the, what's called the PA, the, or the Parapsychological Association. I think it has around 300 members, something on that order. So it's not really big, but uh, these are people who take it uh, fairly seriously. Okay. Now, what about um, spiritualism? I know that when... Um, media, when spiritualism first started to be really big, there were a number of scientists and different people that started to study this. Oh, yes. In, in fact, the Society for Psychical Research uh, was largely started to study spiritualistic phenomena. They also studied things like dowsing and apparitions uh, and clairvoyance. But spiritualism was very, very prominent uh, back in the 
second half of the uh, 19th century. And there were a number of scientists and other very uh, well-regarded intellectuals who were directly involved with studying and experiencing these phenomena. Uh, and so it was partly the SPR was started in order to investigate and document uh, spiritualistic type of phenomena and see whether it was real or it was people's imaginations, what was going on, because it had been so controversial. People were often unsure, is this real or is it fake? Or is it just people believing things that are not true? And to some degree, that's still the case today. One of the most interesting things I found in looking at this historically is that the controversy about these phenomena has been going on literally for thousands of years. This is not new. Uh, the debates and discussions have gone endlessly. Yes, I have to say that I just um, had just wrote a piece on um, the, what the arguments against spiritualism for an SNU project, and I was amazed to see that all of the old arguments that I found from the 1800s, the mid 1800s to late 1800s are still relevant today. I mean, you can oh, yes. take the same things and and just apply it, which is pretty um, amazing. Yeah. So I'm going to redo. Yeah, I'm going to rewrite it and uh, I'm going to do it as a afterlife uh, arguments for for and against afterlife because I counter the things that they said. But in some cases, what I found is that some people, just no matter what you say or what you show them, they just won't believe it. That's true. Uh, the, the paranormal, these phenomena are really interesting because they have a dual aspect. They're quite fascinating, but in many cases, people are sort of repulsed by them. They're attracted to it, but they're kind of pushed away from it uh, unconsciously. So uh -huh. it's a very, very interesting uh, phenomenon to watch. I've known skeptics who will, auto will start getting interested. They see something that's very intriguing, and then they back off, and they don't want to talk about it. And I've seen this over and over. Uh, I've seen parapsychologists confront major phenomena in a seance room, get totally freaked out, and never come back. And these are people who are open to it. And want to see it. It's very interesting. Well, I mean, so, the only thing that I can say about that is that, that their belief system really can't incorporate what they're seeing into it. Uh, yeah, they can't. I think there's also some kind of almost innate fear of it in many cases when they see it. There's, and I think that's not unreasonable. If, you're, if there's something unknown that has a power... It makes sense to kind of step back, but also look at it. But most people just want to pull back and not look at it. Yes, and we're going to pull back for a moment now because we need to go to a break. And you are listening to The Psychic Professor Show with Dr. Susan Barnes. And we're going to take a quick break and come back and explore more about the fascinating subject of the paranormal phenomena. So stay tuned. can be a part of one of the most powerful programs to help create a more joyful, loving, abundant, and peaceful world. Every day at 12 noon in any time zone, join millions of other people around the world to spend a few minutes in joy, love, and gratitude. Brought to you by Robert Schoenfeld, host of the Art of Powerful Living Radio. Together, we can raise the vibration of the planet. For more information, visit globalmomentofjoy.com. Have you ever said to a friend, I am trying to be less stressed, I am hoping to meet someone special, or how about I am working on getting a job I love? Hi, I'm Eve from Elite Tarot, host of the weekly show, Mainstream Metaphysics Radio. Words like hoping, wanting, and trying may seem innocent, however they carry with them emotional weight that actually blocks energy. Next time you start to say these words, say instead, I am becoming less stressed. I am looking forward to meeting someone special. I am pursuing a job I love. 
While your brain may resist, note how your body physically feels as possibility of success suddenly appears. As an intuitive coach and professional tarot card reader, I work with clients worldwide on using energy effectively to embrace joy. If you'd like to schedule a session, please visit my website at EliteTarot.com. That's E-L-I-T-E-T-A-R-O-T.com. Gain powerful insight and practical tools to support you on your spiritual journey. Access your higher self and tune in every second and fourth Thursday at 12 p.m. Pacific to A Life Untethered with Andrew Martin, walking the path of freedom. Andrew is a highly attuned intuitive oracle, energy worker, spiritual teacher, and international radio host. For more about Andrew and his services, visit thelightedones.com. Discover the healing medicine from the giant monkey tree frog, Cambo. Cambo practitioner Ginny Rutherford and professional psychic Todd Rolson have come together for lively discussions of alternative healing medicines from the Amazon. Ginny and Todd bring you Cambo Talk Radio. Tune in each Monday at 1 p.m. Pacific to hear from guests all over the world with real life stories and the medicinal benefits of Cambo. For more information, visit CamboKiss.com. Get ready to experience Truth Talk Radio with host Deb Acker. Tune in to Truth Talk Radio each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com to illuminate the truth in your daily life as you experience life, love, and abundance from a whole new perspective. This hit show will leave you feeling lighter and bring you into a place of infinite possibilities every day in every way. Visit TruthTalkRadioShow.com for upcoming transformative topics and guests. We're back on the Psychic Professor Show with Dr. Susan Barnes. But before we continue, I want to make sure that everybody knows I will be reading for callers in our final segment. The phone number is 800 930 2819. So please call in if you'd like some spiritual advice. And this show is sponsored by the Spirit Art Gallery, www.spiritartgallery.net. My guest today is George Hansen, who is talking with us about psychic and paranormal phenomena. George is the author of the book, The Trickster and the Paranormal, and you can get a copy of the book by going to www.trickster, T-R-I-C-K-S-T-E-R, Trickster Book. Dot com One word. George will also be speaking at Lilydale, New York, next Friday, July 28th, at the All Things Spiritual Lecture Series. And you can go to www.spiritartgallery.net to find out more information about that. Welcome back, George. Well, thank you again. Now, what I'd like to do is is kind of switch a little bit and start to talk a little bit more about what kinds of experiments and research are, are have people done on the paranormal. Well, there are quite a number of different types of experiments. Uh, one of the most famous way back is the work of J.B. Ryan with uh, what are called Zener cards or ESP testing cards. And these would be decks. He used a deck of 25 cards with the signs of circle, cross, wavy lines, square, and star. And so the cards would be hidden, maybe even in another room, possibly even in another country. And people would try to guess the order of the cards. By chance, they'd get one in five right. Uh, so if they got more than that, then there would be statistics applied to see if that was well above chance. So that's it's, it's a little hard for people to understand that uh, sometimes, but statistics is is the basis of many most of the experiments uh, done in parapsychology. If you get, for instance, if you were to describe a scene, say a, a friend of yours went out to some place and. You didn't know where they were, and you tried to describe where they were. Well, how would you know uh, if you were accurate or not? Well, scientifically, that's a little tricky to do. But if the person went out to a randomly selected location and you tried to determine where they were, you might give a description. 
what could be done then is to have someone take your description and look at three or four or five other randomly selected locations and see how well your description matched. And if your description actually matched well to the location, that could be done over and over and a statistical analysis could be done. That's what was done in the government remote viewing program. So that's in a very quick description is how experiments are done with ESP. And there's lots of variations. For instance, it's thought that altered states of consciousness tend to facilitate ESP. And there's a fair amount of evidence that suggests that they do. One of the things our lab did in Princeton was to use what was called the Gonsfeld experiment. And in that case, a person would be put, sit back in a chair and they would have halves of ping pong balls put over the, uh, their eyes and a red light would be show, shown on them. So it, their, the visual information they get was basically just this pink field out in front of them. They couldn't see anything other than that. There'd be headphones put on them and they'd be playing something like a white noise or pink noise, sort of a hiss. Mm -hmm. And the idea there was people who kind of, when the external stimuli are sort of blocked out, people can attend to their internal uh, mental processes a little bit more. And with the Gonsfeld, often people would have mental imagery. And in another room, a person might be shown a video clip and try to send that to the person in the Gonsfeld state. And in that case, after the experiment, would, the sending period would end, the person in the Gonsfeld state would take off the ping pong balls and look at three or four or five different clip, video clips and try to pick the one that best matched what their mental imagery was. And our lab did this a number of times, several hundred experiments like this. And instead of getting 25%, which would happen by about chance, it was more like 33%. And in some cases with certain groups, we had closer to 50% correct, which would be statistically significant if we, with the number of uh, subjects we had. So that's one of the ways these phenomena are tested. Another procedure is what's called random number generator uh, PK. That would, would that indicate that part for mentally influencing an electronic device called a random number generator. And the random number generator might light up a light bulb, it might control a video game, it can be used in a whole variety of ways. But this was and is one of the most commonly used devices in parapsychological testing today, and has been for close to 50 years. Now, so, can you explain to us a little more what remote viewing is, in well, case people don't know? Remote viewing is sort of a, basically a synonym for clairvoyance. But it was a term adopted by the government psychic spying program back in the early 70s, uh, with work done out at the Stanford Research Institute. And basically, a person would s sit in a room, and there would be a target, whatever it would be, whether it was in a box, uh, some small object, or whether it was a location 100 miles away or a location uh, close by and the person would sit and try to describe the target. And they would describe it, and they would perhaps make some drawings, make some notes, and they would do this a number of times. A number of targets would be randomly selected. And then what would be done is to give all those reports, those descriptions of targets, and see if someone else could match them up with the correct targets and that can be statistically assessed as well. So the government and the, and the CIA and other intelligence agencies want to know what's going on in other parts of the world. Can a person sit at a desk and just describe that? And there is pretty good evidence that they were quite successful at doing that. So uh, that's yeah. quickly, uh, in a very quick description, uh, what remote viewing is. So the government was interested in it because they were trying to use it as a spy technique. 
Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. But I don't think it's experiments that a lot of people knew about. Well, it it was quite well known back in the 60s, or the, rather the 70s, uh, and in the 80s. It's not quite as well known today, but uh, a few months ago, a new book came out by a journalist named Annie Jacobson titled Phenomena, and it's all about the government um, remote viewing program. And there are a number of the government psychic spies who have retired and have written books on this. So people actively involved in the paranormal are likely to know about it, but most people probably haven't heard of it, or if they have, they've forgotten about it. So they actually did have some people who were psychic spies? Oh, yes, quite a number of them. Oh, well, one okay. of the most one of the most famous was Ingo Swan, who was an artist living in the Bowery in New York City, and he trained many of the government remote viewers. He was a friend of mine. Oh, now. yes. Mm, you've mentioned him, yes. So... They really did do it. And I'm trying to remember, there was a silly movie that, that was about that, too. Oh, yes. Men Who Stare at Goats. Yeah, that's, I knew there were goats in there. Um, <laughs> yes. Well, I think, and what were they, staring, the... staring at the goats to try to get them to fall over? Was that it? Yep. Yep. Try to kill them. Uh, the, the movie was quite silly. There is a book with the very same name, which is a little bit better. Uh and I think it's largely accurate. There are a few errors in it, but I think generally uh, conveys the idea. A much better book was by Jim Schnabel, one of the first books on the program, uh, titled Remote Viewers, A History of America's Psychic Spies. But there are a bunch of others out there now. Uh, Ed May, who uh, ran the research branch of that program, has come out with several books in the last couple of years. Uh, so there's a lot there's a lot of information and there's a, the CIA has put a lot of the data online. Okay, and we're going to hold that thought for a moment because we have to take our break. Um, I'm Dr. Susan Barnes, and you're listening to the Psychic Professor Show. When we come back, the phone lines will be open open for your readings. Call eight hundred nine three zero two eight one nine, and please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Transformation Talk Radio is dedicated to the education and awareness of Lyme disease. Welcome to Lyme Talk Radio. I'm Dr. Pat Basile, the host of the Dr. Pat Show, and I am so thrilled that we've created this venue for all of you out there. Dr. Pat Basile will be bringing the most innovative, groundbreaking information, research, treatment innovations, and stories from those it affects every day. What we have heard is that you want to ensure for us that we keep positive, holistic, uplifting, transformative talk radio on the air. We're excited to bring you the contemporary conversations about Lyme disease. We promise not to let the light fade on Lyme. So fasten your seat belts. We've got lots more to share with you in the weeks to come. Tune into Lyme Talk Radio with Dr. Pat and help keep our mission strong on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Tune in to The Jen Royster Show, intuitive guidance to inspire your life, each Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific and 11 a.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. This amazing show is an inspirational hour that will take you on an epic metaphysical journey to discover the spiritual approach to life's greatest challenges. Dr. Jen is an internationally known intuitive counselor, spiritual teacher, and energy healer. Call in for intuitive readings and visit JenRoyster.com for more information. Hi there, this is Audrey Michelle, host of Rewired Life Radio. If you've listened to the show, you know I talk a lot about listening to your body. Here's the deal. Listening to your body takes quieting your mind, and I want to teach you how. Actually, we're going to start right now. Take a deep breath, a truly deep breath, all the way to the top of your inhale, and then exhaling to the very bottom of your belly, breathing feeding your body the oxygen and fuel it needs. This is the first step in listening to your body. There's more, but it's so easy. I wanna share a quick meditation with you to help you instantly reconnect with yourself and listen to your body. Simply go to audreymichelle.com slash tips and download it for free today. 
That's Audrey Michelle spelled M I C H E L dot com slash tips. Gifted intuitive healer and spiritual teacher, Sarah Luce, brings her unique style to the hit show, Small Steps, Big Breakthrough Radio on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Tune in each month as Sarah turns reality on end and shows us how to experience expansive results with simple yet powerful steps. Expect an enlightening bend on what you currently believe is possible. For show details and upcoming topics, visit SarahLoose.com. That's S-A-R-A-L-O-O-S.com. And we're back on the Psychic Professor Show with Dr. Susan Barnes. The phone lines are open for readings in our next segment. And please call 800-930-2819. And now I'm going to ask George to tell us how people can get his book, The Trickster and the Paranormal. Well, probably the easiest way is to go online and order it from Amazon.com or from the publisher Ex Libris. So uh, if you just put Trickster Book or Trickster and the Paranormal into Google, it will probably take you to a site that, where you can buy it. I frankly don't push it on people because my mom told me it's kind of a little, little difficult to read at times. But uh, if you want, want to find out about it, I suggest you go to my website, tricksterbook.com, and look at the introduction. That will give you a pretty good idea of what's in the book. Uh, and I do have a number of my professional papers there, and you're more than welcome to download them for free. So have at it if you're so inclined. That's great. And so if people want to learn more about paranormal phenomena, they can go to your website. So that's great. Now, what research is being done today by the government? Well, that's really hard to tell. Uh, I think it's much less than it was done in, the, say, the 1980s and 1970s. Uh, they're not very open about it. Uh, the book Phenomenon, uh, Phenomena by Annie Jacobson indicates that there is some being done, and I certainly strongly suspect so. And some of this probably overlaps with UFO uh, phenomena. There, there's always been a strong connection there in the government work. I'm not completely sure just what that means. But the number of the people who were involved in the remote viewing work were also involved with UFOs. So if you're interested in the general topic of the government research, keep an eye on both topics. That's good advice to listen to. I didn't realize there was such a relationship between the two. And, of course, I've known people that are mediums that have done some of the government research as well. Now, what kind of research are you doing? Well, right now, I'm basically doing library research and theorizing. Uh, at one time, I went out and did ghost investigations, and I have published uh, two papers in professional journals on my ghost investiga investigations. Uh, but right now, I am doing reading on continental philosophy and the work of Jacques Derrida. Uh, Derrida has been almost completely ignored by parapsychologists, but there are a number of anthropologists and other scholars who are looking at his work in relation to ghosts. In fact, quite a number of uh, professional articles on ghosts involve theories of Jacques Derrida. Uh, he was a rather prominent French philosopher, died about 10 years ago, and very controversial but uh, quite scholarly, and I think there's some very interesting new work being done outside of parapsychology on some paranormal topics. Oh, that's very interesting. Yes, I also have noticed that there's more academic papers that are starting to pop up on topics like spiritualism and different things. So that is interesting. Now, ghosts. Do you believe in ghosts? Uh, I've known many, many people who've seen them. Uh, I have seen odd things in seances, not sure what they were, uh, partly in my mind's eye. Uh, so I, don't, I take them seriously. They've been reported for thousands of years in virtually all cultures. I don't think we can ignore them. Um, in fact, um, one of Derrida's most famous books is called Specters of Marx. 
And he talks about spiritualism and dancing tables and all sorts of other things. I don't think it's just a metaphor. I think there's more to it. And a number of other people have been looking at that very seriously in relation to ghosts. So that's a, it's a very radical shift. Uh, the parapsychologists have not picked up on this. But uh, other people are starting to. I think there's some new thinking that's coming along uh, in some rather surprising fields. That's really interesting. And it's the topic of ghosts. And, of course, that the ghost hunters and all of those different ghost shows um, are certainly very popular um, within contemporary culture. So now the academics seem to be um, picking up on it, too. They are. Uh, they keep their distance from the popular work, and they re- the uh, d- the philosophy of Derrida is extremely difficult to understand. It t- it's taken me a very long time to start to even be able to think about it. So uh, it's an odd mix. They're on ParanormalSocieties dot com uh, some months ago. They had like. Two to 3,000 ghost research groups in this country listed. There is an enormous interest, but the actual interest in academe comparatively is quite small. It's there, and it's growing, but the popular interest is huge, and that's very interesting to me. Yes, that is. That sounds great. Okay, and so... What do you think is the future of um, parapsychology? Well, I think it's going to continue. Uh, I think uh, sooner or later some of the old people are going to die off and some of the new people will have some new ideas. Uh, There is a saying that science progresses funeral by funeral, and I think that's going to have to happen with parapsychology. There are some new people coming into the field I'm very excited about. There are some people down at the University of West Georgia that are doing some very interesting work. Jacob Glazier, for one, is writing about uh, uh, Derrida and Heidegger. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Jason Giorgiani, uh, who graduated from NYU, er, and then also um, uh, SUNY Stony Brook. Very interesting book, Prometheus and Atlas. I disagree with him on many things, but he's got some very interesting and innovative ideas. So I think things are changing. But it might be a while before we start seeing uh, much recognition of that. But there's always been interest in this phenomenon. Is are there any um, are there any departments that are studying this academically? There are no departments as such. There are a few people inside other departments, uh, such as at the University of West Georgia. I believe it's in the psychology department. Or at the University of Edinburgh, it's in the psychology department. But the number of people in academe actively studying this is relatively low compared to what it was 30 years ago. There's been a fall off. I think that may eventually change. These things go up and down. But right now we're in sort of a low point. But there are people out there, uh, but they're not too easy to find. Okay. Okay. So you've given everybody some tips on how they can find these para paranormal articles and people to read about. The other um, publication that I can tell people about is the Journal of Extraordinary Experience in Psychology, Psychology with Jeep, which um, also just came out with their summer issue, issue, and I've got an article in that. Um, so there are some publications that you can get on the Internet as well that will tell that- you about... Yeah, And that's for free. And that's a good publication. That, that comes out of the University of West Georgia. And I, I do recommend it. Another one is Paraanthropology that has some very innovative ideas. That's also free. And it's online. So wow. No, that's okay. No, that, no, I think it's very important that the Internet might be a way for people to start getting more information about this and finding out about it. Um, because that's happened in other disciplines as well, is that the Internet has spread the research around and made it more available to more people. So Absolutely, absolutely agree. Another uh, resource <laughs> I use is academia.edu, uh, where a lot of scholars post their, their papers, and I found some really wonderful work there. 
So it does take a little time to learn how to use some of these uh, resources, but it's well worth the time spent. Back yes. Yes, that's no, that's really important. And so that is good that you can. And I mean, I've found just in my own research that I can find a lot of things uh, on the internet. I mean, for example, I can find whole books, spiritualist books from the past. That's how I've done my research. And um, you can find uh, spirit guides writings and you can find all kinds of things online. And I know that there's an organization that's also digitizing a lot of this uh, spiritualist work and kind of esoteric work. Um, so they're making it available for everyone. So this is really, really an important step in trying to bring this out to the, the larger culture. So fully, fully agree. And it's been just a godsend for me, but it's all, all, also almost overwhelming because there is so much out there and it takes a while to be able to find the resources and then start to absorb them. But it is a wonderful resource. Yes, yes. Well, someone gave me about 100 spiritualist books that were out of print, and that I searched those with, you know, they're all in PDF files, so I can search them and find all of the information that I want. So that's really, really helpful. And I'm building up my own list of online books that uh, I can use, and I'm sure you are too. Oh, yes, books and uh, hundreds and hundreds of articles. I don't know if I'm up into the thousands yet, but I'm pretty probably getting pretty close. So, that, yes, there's a lot out there. Okay, we're about to go for another break here, and the phone lines will be open, and you can call 800-930-2819 if you would like some spiritual advice. And please stay tuned. You're listening to The Psychic Professor Show with Dr. Susan Barnes, and we'll be right back. Chris Stainis is a spiritual leader and healer and teaches a course on how you can transform your life through a meditation and healing system that will manifest your spirit's dreams. She manifested the Women of Wisdom Conference, the Women of Wisdom book, and this radio show. And she can show you how to change your life, too. Are you ready? Visit the website and contact her at VoicesOfWomenToday.com. That's VoicesOfWomenToday.com. Do you ever feel as if you're working twice as hard but only getting half as far? Are you trying to connect with your path in life and finding it elusive? Mainstream Metaphysics Radio is a weekly call-in show where we harness our connection with the universe and use what is in our power to affect change for optimal success and happiness. This hit show bridges the divide between what is and what we do not know. Eve, named one of the country's top psychics, also known as the MBA Psychic, invites you on this journey for this live call-in show with readings, featured guests, leaders, and visionaries, in both business and spiritual callings. So join Eve Thursdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com as she takes metaphysics mainstream. For more information about Eve, visit EliteTarot.com. That's EliteTarot.com. Are you feeling stagnant or blocked in your love life, career, health, or finances? experiencing difficulty focusing or setting and achieving goals tune in to spiritual diagnostics radio with psychic visionary healers carol dorian and justice welling discover the cause and effect of unwanted patterns in life tune in every tuesday at 12 p.m pacific on transformation talk radio for more information visit spiritualdeed.com the angel lady.net the angel lady.net TheAngelLady.net 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 1-800-323-1790 Sue Storm TheAngelLady.net TheAngelLady.net Live Your Magnificence For the love of joy is a precious gift offered to us by Robert Schoenfeld 
host of the Art of Powerful Living Radio. He takes us on an incredible 30-day adventure to expand our minds and hearts with the nectar of life, love, and joy. This book will help you bring more joy, love, health, abundance, adventure, romance, and magnificence into your life. We are back on the Psychic Professor Show with Dr. Susan Barnes. The phone lines are open for readings, and you can call the number 800-930-2819. In the meantime, we're going to be continuing to talk about the paranormal phenomena, and I want to remind you that next Friday, um, George will be speaking at Lilydale, New York, and in a lecture series that's going on there. So if you're anywhere in Western New York, stop in and see us. And George, we were talking about different aspects of the paranormal. And one of the things that um, I found interesting in your papers was that it's the elites that seem to really not like paranormal stuff. That's true. And that's been true for thousands of years, actually. Um, The paranormal is basically synonymous with the supernatural. Some people don't like to acknowledge that, but if you look in Webster's, that's the case. The two words mean basically the same thing. And the province of religion, religion has basically been in charge of the supernatural for a very long time. And typically, elites have some reservations about religion. They think it's uh, often think it's superstitious. But even among uh, religious people, there is some aversion or wariness about uh, the paranormal or supernatural. For instance, the Catechism of the Catholic Church explicitly prohibits the practice of clairvoyance and going to mediums. Now, in re- but they also the, tr- the catechism also admits that God reveals uh, prophecies and other information to saints and prophets. So there is a real ambivalence there. On the other hand, you will find the very hard-nosed, extreme skeptics, and if you look at those those people, you will find a very strong aversion or antagonism toward religion. The major skeptical organization, which is now called the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, is based up in Amherst, New York, and they share office space and even in their tax returns are, uh, are combined with an, uh, an atheist organization, uh, the Secular Council for Secular Humanism. So you find this anti-religion, anti-supernatural, anti-paranormal clustering together. And this has happened for a very long time. And you will find in the academic world, you, the, some of the most, more elite scientists are some of the more hostile to the paranormal and supernatural claims. And this has been shown recently, and it's been shown back in the early 1900s. And it actually goes back much farther than that. And one of the papers I do have on my website, on academia.edu, and that those are available free for download. And if you can't manage to do that, uh, uh, you're more than welcome to email me. My address is on virtually every page of my website, and I'd be happy to send you a copy of that, that paper. Also, Why don't you give him your website again? It's tricksterbook.com. And if you forget that, just put George Hansen Paranormal into Google and you'll probably get there. So Great. Thank uh, you. You bet. So there, there is, this goes back a long ways. I have uh, quite a few citations and I will be talking explicitly about this particular aspect in my talk at Lilydale a week from today. Great. Back to you, Sue. I I look forward to that. Yeah, I mean, I do. And then I, I, I sense that it's really interesting that you're saying that so many academics don't want to um, stay away from the religion and the religious stuff. But now I'm seeing so many more um, people starting to look at 
things like spiritualism, um, which has relatively had little written about it uh, for a long time. But now there's all kinds of books that have been coming out on relating it to popular culture. And I know a topic you're interested in relating it to gender issues. Yes, um, there is an ex- been an extraordinary burst of interest in the academic world on the issue of spiritualism and related topics. But you have to realize, they're looking at it from a distance. It happened long ago and far away. There are relatively few people in the academic world who are coming out and looking at spiritualism as it's happening right now. If, it, if they talk about it from a... Uh, about, happening 100 years ago, that's a safe position to be in. Even then, they can come in with to some flack uh, from their colleagues. But if they were to go out and study spiritualism at, say, Lilydale or some of the other uh, spiritualist camps or churches, they would be looked down upon. And this has been the case for a very long time. There is a real stigma. Even the skeptics group uh, came in, uh, had to encounter the, uh, the uh, stigma. The major skeptics organization was called the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. And back in 2006, they dis- they dropped the word paranormal from their name because of the bad reputation of the word paranormal. So, which is very odd. You would think that scientists wouldn't be afraid of a word or wouldn't be stigmatized by it, but they are. So there are very strong social forces that, that tend to taint this area. So back to you, Zoo. Yeah, but I also would say that I really think the role of spiritualism in American history has been pretty much erased too. I mean, oh, it has. Yeah. Yes, it is. There are a few scholars who are pointing out the very close association with the abolitionist movement and women's rights. Uh, there's a woman named Anne Brody who wrote a wonderful book, Radical Spirits. But even when she was writing the book about the relationship between women's rights and spiritualism, some of her colleagues did not want to hear that. They thought it would taint the women's rights in the feminist movement. And she got some flack, and she wrote about that explicitly in the second edition of her book. Yes, but so where, we, yeah, where we are here in western New York, um, you have to look at the two of them together. We know that spiritualism was went hand-in-hand hand with the women's rights movement. I know the story is here in Lilydale that Susan B. Anthony was supposed to uh, um, speak at another place and they wouldn't let her speak because she was a woman. So she came to Lilydale and spoke there. And I've also noticed in some of their literature that they've had a lot of women who've been involved with, um, you know, abortion and women's rights and different things that have come to speak. Yes, yes, indeed. Spiritualists have been very open to alternative views uh, and people sort of on the margins of society. Absolutely the case. Uh, but people on the margins can seem kind of threatening or kind of tainted to people who want to be straight and narrow. And that's one of the very interesting things about spiritualism. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of data and a lot of uh, theorizing anthrop- and anthropology on that under the rubric of what's the word, the word liminality, or mm-hmm. liminal, and marginality. Uh, and that's often related to religious themes and religious ritual. That's much too, uh, much, uh, too much to go into here, but there is some pretty good understanding of this all in the anthropological literature, but people largely avoid that. And even today, where it's relevant, people tend to forget about it or avoid addressing it. And I've yes, watched this over and over. Yeah, they do, because, I mean, I, I forget how many hundreds of thousands of people were, were spiritualists in the late 1800s. Oh, yes. Yeah. But it, it seemed, it, yeah. Might have it even seemed, gone into the millions. Yes, it was a yeah. large, it was huge interest. Huge interest. And I know that there is some relationship with the Civil War and spiritualism and that some of the figures um, overlapped with um, Abraham Lincoln. And that, of course, has been written out of history as well, too. Yes. uh, And many of the spiritualists were very against slavery. And that's uh, very much part of history. And people have forgotten about that. 
there yes, were I know. spiritualists on the on the side of the South too, but I think predominantly, uh, as my impression is, they were much more anti-slavery. Yeah, pretty much. Yes, because up here there was the spiritualists, and they, this was a big area for the Underground Railroad because they used to sneak them across over to Canada mm-hmm, mm-hmm. through all the different waterways here. So, so there are houses in my neighborhood that have the places where they would hide the slaves to get oh, them across. Interesting. Oh, interesting. yeah. Yeah, some of the houses here have that. And, well, a lot of the places here are very Victorian, so it's there. But it's amazing, too, because this area, it's another whole topic of discussion, was such a hotbed for different religious ideas and concepts. Uh, Mormonism started here. Christian science started here. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other religions that didn't quite catch on that all started here in western New York. Yes, I think the term the burned over district has been used, and there are a number of books on this. The upper state New York, it was very interesting historically in this sense. Yes, yes. And it's still interesting to live here. <laughs> I'm sure. Although not as much much going on as it was in the, in the olden days. So... With that said, I think we're coming to the end of the show. And I would like to thank you, George, so much for being such a wonderful guest. You were really, really informative. And please check out his website, um, tricksterbook.com. And um, just to let you know, we're here every week at 5 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Pacific, and 10 p.m. GMT. Next week on the Psychic Professor Show, I will have Ed Edwards. He was the inspiration for the film Phenomenon with John Travolta. So have a really spiritual week, and I'll be back again next Friday with Ed, who is a phenomenon within himself. Goodbye. You've been listening to The Psychic Professor Show with Dr. Susan Barnes, the Voices of Spirit Radio. Dr. Barnes' deep knowledge of spiritual issues provides an hour of lively talk and discussion about everything from historical facts to transcommunication. To download this show or any past shows, or to learn more about Dr. Susan and her spirit-inspired art, visit spiritartgallery.net.